We begin our report in Florida as residents there are bracing for Hurricane Idalia's impact. The storm is expected to hit the state as a Category 3 hurricane. At that strength, winds will be between 111 and 129 miles per hour. Idalia's path is expected to impact a central portion of the state. And Governor Ron DeSantis has declared a state of emergency that covers more than 45 of the 67 counties in the state. Omar Villafranca begins our coverage from Crystal River, Florida. Adalia's initial impact was felt from the Florida Keys up to Tampa. High winds, heavy rains, and some flooding. The eye of the storm is taking aim at the Big Bend region of Florida's Gulf Coast, which is bracing for hurricane force winds of at least 111 miles per hour. Authorities urgently telling residents in mobile homes and areas prone to flooding to get out now. The one consistent response from everyone who made the decision to stay is that I will never do that again. So understand that Mother Nature wins every time. In Crystal River, Florida, Dirk Randolph and Amanda Chilcott, along with their dog Lucy, are not taking any chances with the deadly storm surge expected to reach nearly 15 feet in some areas. I'm not worried about the winds, I'm worried about the water. So the water raising, like that's gonna come in the house, it's, you know, it's gonna ruin your car. Evacuation orders have been issued for more than two dozen counties. In Cedar Key, there's only one bridge to get on and off the island. Some fear those staying behind could be trapped after the storm. This is my first one where I'm like really concerned. Preparing for the worst, patients are being moved out of hospitals and care centers. Close to 100 of the most vulnerable have been evacuated to higher ground. Being safe is, is the appropriate thing and, and erring on the side of caution is the appropriate thing. Ted Scouten exactly with our there. CBS station in Miami yeah, is in the Florida surf, Keys. Storm surge is expected to be a foot or two, so add that to everything. And what they're concerned about here is flooding. You can see in this area here, uh, water has already come over the seawall. Earlier today, we were actually back by the wall, and there was no water here. Now it's completely filled. It's pretty scary. It's kind of yeah. crazy. Um, we've never been down here, and this is quite an experience for our first time in Key West. And Omar Villafranca joins me now. Omar, what's, uh, give us a sense of the things on the ground right now. Uh, th this is the proverbial calm before the storm. People have already gone to the grocery store. They've gassed up. Um, and a lot of people say they've made their preparations on, on, on what they think is going to happen, and, and they're ready for it. At this point, we're just waiting uh, for the storm to happen. Of note, is worth in, uh, noting that you know we talked to the sheriff of Citrus County here where we are, and he told me uh, for the residents who stay behind uh, that once the sustained winds reach 45 miles an hour, his deputies are not going to respond to calls because it's not safe. So if a resident has a problem and they stayed behind, they're going to have to wait until after the storm passes passes and it's safe for those officers to go out. That's one of the things they tell them to get them to move to higher ground and to leave flood zones. Is that working? I mean, it was so when Hurricane Ian hit, a lot of people ignored the state's evacuation orders. That was last year. Um, how are they following them this time? Are there still those people who they don't go anywhere? And then afterwards, we interview them when they say we should have gone somewhere. Well, and a lot of people don't have anywhere to go. Now, there are shelters, but the, from what we are, are hearing and seeing, they're not really filling up with people uh, as of this point. But uh, the evacuations, they say mandatory, but there's no government entity going door to door and removing anyone from their house at all. They're just telling them, if you stay and you need help, we're not going to be able to help you. Uh, you need to get out. So there's not exactly a physical removal at all of that. So um, the people who are going to hunker down in any storm, and I've covered them, you know, across the Gulf Coast and on, on the East Coast, they're not going to leave. Either they don't have a place to, to go to or they want to stay behind and make sure their place is okay. And, and for, for some people who are feeling, I'm, I'm going to roll the dice and, and uh, write it out. And finally, Omar, you mentioned what the sheriff is, the message the sheriff is putting out there. How, what other kinds of preparations are mm -hmm. officials making? 
Well, in the counties, they were setting out areas for people to come and make their own sandbags, which is pretty common here on the Gulf Coast. Uh, people are just filling sandbags up. They put them in front of their house farther out and near the door. Um, and people are, we, we talked to one couple in that package, they were tying their boats. Uh, they lift them up as much as they can, but if the storm surge goes higher, they tie them to the house or to bigger structures and trees and poles because if it floats, they don't want it to float away. It's hard to find your boat after it's floated away. So it's an interesting thing that people do here. They tether uh, their valuables and try to put, you know, whatever that they do not want getting wet as high as they possibly can in their house or maybe an attic. Uh, and some homes actually have been built up. Those folks, we notice some of them are staying. Hard to find your boat or you'll find it in Joe's yard. Omar Villafranca in Crystal River, Florida. Thanks yes. so much, Omar. <laughs> For more, we are joined by CBS News senior weather and climate producer David Parkinson. He's here in studio again. David, we uh, talked last night. What's the difference? Where's things going today? Uh, yeah, we, we've got a lot more certainty just because the storm is actually starting to move. It's now moving north at 14 miles an hour. So let me take you through everything and show you what we know here. Uh, this is the latest view, and you can see the storm is much more organized just a quick aside, by the way, this is Franklin. I mean, that is the most symmetrically beautiful hurricane I have ever seen. And we should be very thankful that is not what is making landfall because that was a, a Category 4 with incredible power earlier today. This storm, though, is organizing. It was at 75 miles an hour this morning. It gained to 100 as of the 5 p.m. advisory, so 25 miles an hour. They did that in 12 hours. So if you time that out, certainly a Category 3 is something that we're most likely to see here. But let me show you. This is the official cone from the Hurricane Center. And as you can see, Category 3 intensification expected landfall somewhere in the 8 to 10 a.m. region. And then look at this. By the time we're in the afternoon, it's still an inland category one. This is now an inland flood threat too. And then it emerges off the South Carolina coast. And then it looks like it might actually want to hang out here. I, I can't deal with the emotional trauma of that just yet if this thing Wait. just sits and spins for a week. But right now we need to focus. We're 12 hours, give or take away from the worst of this storm hitting the coast. Well, I, can hurricanes combine? It looks like it's going to go join Franklin. So, no. Essentially, what happens is, is they, they do what's called the Fujiwara, which is they kind of they, uh, do an orbit around each other. So, in this case, they wouldn't actually fuse. One would just, you know, pivot around. Franklin also is going to begin to clear out of here. So, that is the good news there. Tell us about the areas. Um, storm surge is something that um, is so important and so dangerous. Tell us the areas that that need to be worried about storm surge. And remind us why storm surge is so dangerous. Yeah, so storm surge, here's the key, key part here, right? If the storm is coming up right here, if that's the track, the water's got nowhere to go. I mean, it is being funneled into the big bend of Florida. And as such, it's just got to pile into all of these rivers, into all these estuaries, and then into Tampa Bay. Because remember, if the storm is here, you've got a low pressure system, which means the wind is counterclockwise. So all this water is now being fed into Tampa Bay once the storm has passed. So in the morning, you're probably OK. But once it is past your latitude, that's where the storm surge is happening. Meanwhile, if you're up here, again, you want any of the water that's pushing onto land here. This is where you're going to be seeing you know, the potential for 7 to 10 feet of storm surge where Omar was. So that dry shot that you saw is not going to be one. Uh, storm surge is the number one killer with hurricanes. Uh, it, this one is a foot, uh, sorry, a story to a story and a half in a person's house. So, uh, you know, unless you've got an incredibly elevated structure, it's incredibly dangerous to stay around, uh, particularly if you are north of Crystal River uh, and you are anywhere along the coastline. Uh, this is beyond life-threatening. It is borderline unsurvivable. But... You know, you've got storm surge now on the Atlantic coast, two to four feet there. You've got four to seven in Tampa Bay. The record in Tampa Bay is about four feet. So this could be record storm surge for Tampa. And it's absolutely record storm surge for the Big Bend. The other change from last night that I just want to quickly point out here is the change in the, you know, just how disparate these cones were, right? If you'll, if you'll recall. The different had, models. Right. We had a, a huge spread. This is now all narrowing the hurricane center now right in the center as we go further up. Uh, earlier, though, in the, uh, in the track of the storm, you can see here, uh, there it is. Uh, it's a lot more together, but it's a very narrow lane. We don't have a risk of coming in here in Crystal Beach. It's basically Horseshoe Beach up through Perry, and then basically your westernmost 
would be through Tallahassee. But keeping in mind, if the storm is moving up here, you would think that the storm would make a little bit of a rightward tug because that's where the storm is loaded. But the chance that this storm goes straight north is very much possible. So this realistically right here is your window for landfall as we come into to the day. And then uh, we'll watch it sort of spread out from there as we go uh, further along. If you take a look at the future cast, what that means, just so everyone's kind of clear on this, you can see once the storm makes landfall in the midday, then we get really heavily northwestern loaded. So you may be dealing with hurricane force winds in Savannah with absolutely no rain and some storm surge. Mm. But to the north and west, we've now got a, uh, an inland flood threat. And then as this continues to track right up here into North Carolina, it stays a tropical storm. But if we actually take a look at just how much uh, additional rainfall is going to happen here, this is amazing. The maximum is right here around Moorhead City, North Carolina. It's not where the landfall is. Yeah. It's not in inland Georgia. It's up in Moorhead City. So this is not just a threat for here, which it will be in the next 12 hours, but by Thursday morning, this is your story. So the time is to prepare now for South Carolina and North Carolina, because there's a lot of people here who are thinking this is Florida storm. Yes, there's going to be some threats here, but you can't sleep on the inland flood threat as this storm moves along. And we often see that on these tropical systems in the low country of North Carolina. David Parkinson, not sleeping on a darn thing. Thank you very much. And introducing us to Fujiwara. Thanks so much, David.